Good morning. Um, thank you, first of all, to the organisers for their very kind invitation. I'm, I'm very honoured to be here. And thank you to Fiden in particular. Uh, so my topic today, uh, or my subtopic, I should say, is titled Friend or On Friend, which um, I have decided to interpret to mean um, uh, how do arbitrators and counsel navigate the use of social media in a way that avoids a challenge to arbitrators' independence and impartiality. And um, when I was uh, putting this presentation together, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the quote from a commentator came to mind that uh, the internet is the first thing that humans have built that um, they have uh, completely failed to understand. Um, and uh, that's certainly true, I think, for a lot of lawyers, particularly the elderly generation. Uh, I'm not sure for all the, the millennials in the room here. Um, but it is, uh, you know, that quote highlights the ongoing challenge um, of ensuring that uh, arbitral rules and arbitral guidelines somehow manage to keep up with the pace of the ever-changing virtual landscape. Uh, so that's what I want to explore this morning. And uh, my first starting premise is, uh, what do we mean when we talk about social media? Uh, and in a, the, legal, the context of the legal community, I think it's safe to say that what we're talking about are essentially three platforms. Uh, firstly, Facebook. Uh, secondly, LinkedIn. And thirdly, Twitter. Uh, and they have their own terminology for connections, Facebook. Uh, the connections of friends, LinkedIn, it's connections, Twitter, it's, it's followers. Um, the second premise is that it's, uh, it's not practical or desirable at all uh, to require all active arbitrators and all active members of the arbitral community to immediately deactivate their social media accounts or prohibit setting them up in the first place. Uh, we live in the 21st century, and that's just frankly not realistic. Arbitrators are, are, are people, um, at least I think most of them are, with families, friends, and wider social networks. And there's no reason at all why arbitrators shouldn't be entitled to use Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn just like anyone else. And there's another important point here as well, uh, as some of the speakers have alluded to already, uh, social media is an invaluable opportunity uh, for arbitrators to market themselves to their peers, to their colleagues. And that's particularly true of the younger generation of arbitrators who are trying to make a name for themselves. Um, so what, what, do the, uh, what do the current guidelines have to say about this issue? Uh, well, the IBA guidelines on the conflict of interest in uh, international arbitration were revised in 2014 uh, and the previous iteration, as many of you know, was from 2004. That was a point in time when social media platforms were in their infancy. Uh, Facebook had just been created. Um, I think Twitter was still a, a glint in its, uh, its founder's eye at that point. Um, so the 2014 guidelines were the first chance for, uh, for the IBA committee to, to really take, uh, take into account the explosion in uh, social media over the prior 10 years. And they did so through uh, the uh, amendment to two, uh, two different provisions in particular. The first is section 4.3.1, which says that an arbitrator has a relationship with another arbitrator or with the council for one of the parties through a social media network. And again, 4.4.4, the arbitrator has a relationship with one of the parties or its affiliates through a social media network. Now, both of these scenarios fall under the so-called green list, which means that uh, there's no appearance of conflict of interest, there's no actual conflict of interest exists from an objective point of view, and therefore there is no obligation uh, on the arbitrator to disclose the mere fact of a connection through a social media network. However, it's interesting to read the published comments from the IBA conference panel uh, that debated this issue in October 2013. I think it gives some insight into the thinking behind 
um, behind the edits that were ultimately made to uh, the RBA guidelines. And when you look at those comments, there seems to be or have been a, a general agreement that uh, where such networks are effectively an online database or forum for exchanging resumes, they are, quote, easy candidates for inclusion on the green list. And uh, Hilary Halbrin, QC, made the point uh, in that particular committee meeting that uh, a, a distinction should be drawn between the source of the relationship and the nature of the relationship. And that seems to me to be, uh, to be quite appropriate and correct. Uh, so the issue is really whether such social media connections are indicative of a, a quote, close personal relationship, which would indeed be disclosable under the IBA guidelines. Uh, what's also interesting about the IBA discussion is the apparent assumption from all of the contributors that all three of the main social networks that I've talked about, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook, shared the same basic function of acting as a virtual professional marketing tool. Now, while that may well be true of LinkedIn, it's certainly debatable with regards to Twitter and even more debatable with regards to Facebook. And this distinction between uh, professional networking sites on the one hand and social networking sites on the other uh, has indeed been picked up by other commentators who have uh, who've written on this topic uh, and who have gently criticised the latest iteration of the IBA rules for not, uh, not making that distinction between Facebook and LinkedIn in particular. And they've advocated classifying a Facebook friendship as an orange list issue that would be disclosable and may potentially give rise to just justifiable doubts as to the arbitrator's independence or impartiality. Now that seems to me, and I'd be interested to hear what the, the audience and the other panel members think about that, but it, it's a, it seems to me a somewhat utopian approach that ignores the messy realities of life. It would capture a situation where two students, uh, perhaps people in this room, friend each other at law school, then don't speak for the next 20 years, 25 years, and then find themselves involved in an arbitration where uh, one of those individuals was counsel and the other was arbitrator. And I, I don't think it could be seriously contended that there was a, a conflict of interest issue that would arise from that particular scenario. It would also capture a scenario where uh, two existing practitioners friend each other uh, purely for professional networking purposes, just as they would do on LinkedIn. And again, I, I don't think that there would be any dispute that in, in that scenario, uh, there is a, a conflict of interest that would give rise to a challenge or certainly a successful challenge. Uh, indeed, those who have proposed making Facebook friendships an orange list issue have also acknowledged that what really should be determinative of any, um, uh, of any independence or impartiality challenge is the nature of the relationship and not the source. And so the, the, the issue is, uh, how can that be, be properly measured? Um, and one suggestion has been that uh, the closeness of a Facebook relationship can be quantitatively measured through social media mining. Um, in other words, uh, having these specialist companies uh, mine the data that is available from Facebook uh, to determine... Uh, the quantity of interactions between two Facebook friends uh, and indeed the quality of those reactions. Uh, now that seems to me a highly questionable proposal and quite aside from the, uh, the multiple legal hurdles uh, with regards to privacy laws um, that would need to be overcome, um, it, it's also doubtful that prospective arbitrators would tolerate that level of intrusion into their private digital lives. And it also begs the question, it, are, are, is this proposing a solution uh, to a problem that doesn't, in fact, exist? Um, indeed, there are only a handful of cases currently that deal with this issue of arbitrators and their online identity, and I want to just explore a few of them briefly. Uh, the first is a 2014 decision of the French Lyon Court of Appeal. And briefly, the facts of that case 
In 2009, an award was rendered in Paris by a tribunal of three arbitrators. Uh, the losing party sought to annul the award on the basis that the opposing counsel was a Facebook friend of the presiding arbitrator and that she had supported his candidacy for election to the Paris Bar by liking his Facebook status. Uh, now, ultimately, the award was upheld on the basis that the like was rendered after the award was issued. Um, now, the, the relevance of the simple Facebook friendship itself wasn't, in fact, considered in the judgment. Uh, that's presumably because the court concluded that this was not significant in itself without the existing existence of other compelling circumstances. Um, the, the next case cropped up in Denmark, and this was a Supreme Court decision, uh, the Danish Supreme Court. Um, and it was a criminal matter where the defendant had been uh, convicted of pushing uh, his victim at a public demonstration. And the defendant appealed um, after the conviction, having discovered that one of the lay judges on the district court was uh, registered as a Facebook friend of the victim. Um, and the defendant argued that consequence, consequently, as a result of this friend, uh, Facebook friendship, the lay judge was unable to make a completely impartial judgment. Uh, now, to, to compound the issue, the judge had on two prior occasions written positive comments on the, face, uh, the victim's Facebook page and had once issued a supportive statement toward the victim in a campaign critical uh, of the victim's political views. Uh, now, when the, the Supreme Court looked into this and investigated it in more detail, um, it was dispositive as far as they were concerned that the judge and victim didn't know each other personally. They'd never met and they had never spoken to each other. So their uh, relationship existed purely on, on the virtual level through um, this friendship, uh, Facebook connection. And the Supreme Court therefore held that there was absolutely no doubt as to the impartiality and independence of the lay judge and upheld the conviction. Uh, now, finally, um, the German court in 2016 uh, issued a judgment. Um, uh, again, this was in a, a criminal matter. Um, and this was concerning whether a, uh, a judge's online profile and statement on Facebook cast doubt on his independence and impartiality with regards to the conviction of two suspects. So this is it's obviously slightly different from the two cases we've just looked at. This isn't about a Facebook friendship connection per se. It's rather about um, how a judge has presented himself uh, on his Facebook profile. And um, uh, in this particular instance, um, uh, the judge who had uh, uh, con uh, convicted the... Um, uh, uh, had convicted um, the, this, this chap had uh, been depicted on his Facebook profile page of wearing a T-shirt with the statement, we will provide you with a home prison. Um, and um, uh, to make matters worse, on his profile page, uh, the judge had then commented um, under this picture, this is, uh, this is my quote, when you get out, I'll be in retirement. Look, <laughs> um, so the, the German Supreme Court in that instance uh, did in fact uphold the challenge to the conviction on the basis that the content of the judge's Facebook page showed that the attitude of the judge uh, suggested that he in fact uh, quite enjoyed and uh, derived a lot of fun from condemning suspects um, and giving them hefty convictions. Now, this case is significant for a few reasons. Firstly, it's the only known case, certainly, that I've been able to find that granted a challenge on the basis of inappropriate statements on social media networks. Uh, it also clarified that a distinction between a judge's private sphere and uh, his or her professional conduct uh, does not exist when the judge's comments concern his or her profession. And then finally, a close and concrete connection to the challenge did not need to be established where the judge's behaviour concerned uh, his or her attitude to the profession in general. So where does this leave us? Well, uh, just a few brief concluding thoughts. Firstly, the mere fact of 
friending on Facebook or connecting on LinkedIn uh, clearly is not a sufficient basis for a success successful challenge. Um, and that's something uh, that the IBA guidelines uh, appear to agree with. Um, that said, friending a council, uh, an arbitrator friending a council or vice versa during the pendency of ar uh, an arbitral proceeding is probably inadvisable and uh, the safest course is to refrain from any social media activity between uh, an arbitrator and a council during the duration of the proceedings. And that might be a point that we might want to pick up on and explore further during the debate. Um, uh, and so finally, in conclusion, the real issue, uh, it, it's clear to me, is not at the connection per se, uh, but really what an arbitrator's Facebook profile might convey to the wider world, and particularly whether it could be used to cast doubt uh, on uh, the judges or the arbitrator's independence uh, and impartiality. Thank you very much.